The following audio has been provided to us from the 2023 Reformation and Worship Conference hosted by the Midway Presbyterian Church in Powder Springs, Georgia. In this lecture, teaching elder Carlton Wynn outlines the incompatibility of modernism with Christianity. Modernism, or theological liberalism, is fundamentally an assault on the transcendence of God in an attempt to do away with the distinction between the Creator and the creature. In this lecture, Dr. Wynne helpfully defines transcendence, and he reminds us that God's transcendence is not simply an extension of categories of creatureliness. In so doing, Dr. Wynne fortifies us against some of the errors creeping into Reformed theology in our own day. In the main portion of his lecture, Dr. Wynne identifies four movements in which the modernist attempts to compromise God's transcendence in order to accommodate God to the culture. Dr. Wynn closes with several applications to guard our own hearts against compromising the transcendence of God, as well as to treasure the importance of God's transcendence to our eternal hope and comfort in the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Carlton Wynn is on the faculty of the Reformed Theological Seminary in Atlanta and an associate pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church, also in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, in a moment of collective brilliance, the vast committee organizing this conference chose a wonderful title, Christianity or Modernism. I love how this conference title triumphantly recovers the conjunction, or it was featured in J. Gresson Machen's 1922 article titled Liberalism or Christianity. And some of you will know that this article was published in the Princeton Theological Review It was an expansion on an address he gave to a group of ruling elders in Chester, Pennsylvania. And that article, Liberalism or Christianity, became the substance of his 1923 book, Christianity and Liberalism. And much has been made that 2023 is the 100th anniversary of the publication of this wonderful book. Less well known, however, is that 2023 is also the 50th anniversary, not just of the PCA, but of the animated musical educational project, Schoolhouse Rock. (laughs) I'd like to quote a bit of the catchy song from season two, episode two of Schoolhouse Rock titled Conjunction Junction. If you remember this grade school classic, a little blue train conductor sings, conjunction, junction, what's your function? Hooking up words, phrases, and clauses. Is it coming back to you now? The blue train conductor goes on to explain a few key conjunctions, and that's an additive, like this and that. But that's sort of the opposite. Not this, but that. And then there's or, O-R, when you have a choice like this or that. Machen's article, Liberalism or Christianity, had that conjunction in it, and the function of the conjunction was to set before us the chasm of differences, and therefore the choice we all must make between biblical Christianity on the one side and theological liberalism, or as he used it synonymously, modernism on the other. And in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, over seven chapters, Machen shows us how comprehensive and comprehensively incompatible are the distinct religions of the Christian faith and its modernist counterfeit. Let me just review for us from Machen's corpus a few of these incompatibles. Modernism trusts in the natural resources of fallen man. Christianity places its confidence in the saving resources of the God-man. Modernism hopes in social progress fueled by scientific advancement. Christianity appreciates true scientific advancements, but hopes in the renewing power of the Spirit of God. Modernism confesses an ethic of utilitarianism, whatever works for the greatest number. Christianity holds to a revealed ethic centered on God as man's highest good. Modernism pursues an earthly kingdom through social progress. Christianity heralds a heavenly kingdom that rescues sinners from the curse on this world. Modernism loves vague language. Christianity commends itself by an open statement of the truth. 
Modernism is indifferent to doctrine. It sees doctrine as so many jello-like expressions of human experience. Christianity, if you will, is doctrine, revealed in history, fueling the Christian life, centered on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Worst of all, modernism is not simply unbelief out there somewhere. Modernism is a specific worldview, a spirit, an impulse that snaked its way into the church in the form of theological liberalism. Christianity is a Christ-exalting, church-preserving, world-saving faith. Modernism uses the language of Christianity, Machen said, but each of them spring from different roots. Modernism undermines the authority of Scripture. It has no consciousness of sin. Machen said it seeks only to emulate a false Christ rather than worship the true one. It turns the church into a social club. It empties the power of the cross, and it sullies the river of life that alone can revive a weary world. And for all of this, Machen said, and I quote, modernism is the greatest menace which the Christian church has faced for hundreds of years. This is the question I want to ask this morning. What did Machen believe was the deepest assault of modernism on the Christian faith? What did he think was the most basic, most pivotal, most consequential betrayal of biblical Christianity by the modernist preacher, thinker, or church? I believe in Christianity and liberalism. He actually gives us the answer to this question. On page 54 of the authorized version of Christianity and liberalism, and the author authorized version is the one with the foreword by Carl Truman. <laughs> Machen writes these words, the truth is that liberalism has lost sight of the very center and core of the Christian teaching. In the Christian view of God, there are many elements but one attribute of God is absolutely fundamental in the Bible. One attribute is absolutely necessary in order to render intelligible all the rest. That attribute is the awful transcendence of God. Notice how Machen accords to God's transcendence the highest degree of importance. He says it lies at the very center and core of Christian teaching. He says it is, quote, absolutely fundamental in the Bible. He says that divine transcendence is absolutely necessary to render intelligible all the rest. And then he adds this, from beginning to end, the Bible is concerned to set forth the awful gulf that separates the creator from the creature. In modern liberalism, on the other hand, this sharp distinction between God and the world is broken down. And the name God is applied to the mighty world process itself. Friends, it's fair to say that we could hardly be dealing with anything more consequential, more significant for our lives than this attribute of God. Indeed, what we could call the attribute of the attributes of God, the transcendence of the living God. I want to do three things in our short time this morning. Number one, if we're to understand modernist compromises of divine transcendence, we need to know what transcendence is. We need to know what God's transcendence is and isn't. So that's the first thing we'll do. Secondly, getting to the title of this message, I want to trace out for us how modernism has sought to compromise God's transcendence. What are the steps that it takes? What are the consequences that it brings? And then thirdly, I want to mention just a few ways we can guard the plot. That we can delight in the transcendence of God as the church of Jesus Christ, that we can glory in the God who is and who was and who forever will be the transcendent God of heaven and earth. Here's a thesis statement that summarizes what we're doing. God's transcendence is the presupposition of everything that we hold dear in the Christian faith. Without it, all of our theology becomes idolatry, all of our worship becomes self-indulgence, all of our Christianity becomes modernist religion. And this absolute importance of God's transcendence for biblical Christianity is the reason that modernism has sought to compromise it. But how does it happen? It happens slowly and methodically and deceptively. But before we get there, let's think about what transcendence is and what it isn't. God's transcendence is his total otherness, his absoluteness as God, in contrast to everything that he has made. 
God's transcendence means that he lies above and beyond all creation. As Solomon prayed at the temple dedication, 1 Kings 8, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. God's knowledge, his power, his love, God's wisdom, righteousness, truth, and purity, all that God is and all that God does infinitely outstrips every creature limitation, every boundary, every creaturely norm. God surpasses creaturely existence, all created thought, all creaturely desire and activity. It should leave us in awe of him. The prophet Isaiah says, all the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. And then you remember the prophet challenges the idol makers of the world. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? And the answer is no one. No creature can be compared with God. Then the psalmist piles on in Psalm 113, who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? And again, the answer is no one. God is fundamentally incomparable to anything on earth. Listen to Herman Bovink. He says, there is no name that fully expresses God's being, no definition that captures him. He infinitely transcends our picture of him, our ideas of him, our language concerning him. He is not comparable to any creature. You see, it's at this point, though, that a risk enters in when considering God's transcendence. And the risk is that we actually become enamored with ourselves and we lose contact with the God who is by conceiving of him as unbiblically distant and unknowable. Here's what I mean. It's possible to conceive of God's transcendence by beginning with ourselves and then trying to work our way up to God. To begin with ourselves and then work our way up to our creaturely limitations and then use them as a springboard to leap into the darkness and then say, God's transcendence is something infinitely beyond who I am in the darkness above. His transcendence is forever beyond who we know ourselves to be. Let me illustrate this with a personal analogy from my marriage. My lovely wife helps to teach and, and coach at the school where my three sons attend. And when I go to that school with my wife, which I love doing, I see that she is an active, floating beacon of light and encouragement and joy, and I love it. And every time I go, she is not Carlton's wife. If anything, I am Lindley's husband. But, but I am less than that. I am transparent. I am disposable. I am virtually anonymous. If you can take out that creaturely nature of the illustration but retain the message about proper directionality, you will see that when we consider God's transcendence, we can never begin with ourselves and then work our way up to God. This is not the way. So we need to move from what God's transcendence is to what it isn't. And we can put it this way, God's transcendence is not defined by infinitely extending our creatureliness. Rather, his transcendence is what defines our creatureliness. We don't grasp his transcendence simply by extending the categories of space and time as though God transcends us only in degree, but not also in kind and in quality. So do this for a moment. Take the highest conception of any human trait, remove from it everything momentary and imperfect, Stretch it to the breaking point, crank it to 11, sling it as far as you can into the utmost reaches of the galaxy, and you will still fall infinitely short of the way that that trait applies to God. God is infinite, but his infinity is not an extension of space. God transcends space. God is eternal, but his eternality is not an extension of time. It's, it's not a gathering up of all of our calendars. God's eternality transcends time. God is immutable, 
But his unchangeability is not a frozen, static state of being. It's not the negative mirror image of all of our activity. God transcends all creaturely change, and yet he remains unchangeably active as the triune God. God is omnipotent. But his omnipotence is not simply the the conglomeration of all worldly strength. God's power infinitely transcends all the power of the world. God is omniscient. Okay, you're getting the picture here. But his omniscience is not simply a, a sum total of all the facts that we know. He doesn't simply know more than we do. No, his, his knowledge transcends our knowledge in purity and in depth and in content. And this means that the only way to apprehend something of the transcendent God is by first acknowledging him as the self-existent God, as the fullness of divine life, and as the God who reveals himself to us. So we can speak of him, but we speak of him only because he has first said something about himself to us. We can name him, but only because he's named himself and revealed that name to us. We exist only because he reflects his eternality in time and his immensity in space, even as he fills all space without becoming spatial. And he fills all time without becoming temporal. We stand before him because all things are defined by him. And we worship him because he is the God from whom and through whom and to whom are all things. You see, his his transcendence grounds the fact that we can know him. And this leads to the second thing that transcendence is not. His transcendence is not in competition with his imminence. That is, his nearness, his with usness. Please hear this. God's, God's transcendence is the way that he is near to us. This is so important, so often lost in contemporary conversations. God is transcendent even as he is nearer to you than your own breath. His transcendence is not in conflict with his imminence. God is transcendent as he is imminent. And he is imminent as he remains transcendent. He doesn't have to overcome his transcendence. He doesn't have to add to himself. He's not looking down from on high, wondering how he's going to get in touch with this world. No, he remains the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God in all of his mercy and compassion and providence and hatred of sin and love of justice. The Holy Spirit was transcendent as he hovered over the face of the waters. The Father is transcendent as he upholds and directs all things. The Son remains transcendent even as he has assumed to himself a human nature, body and soul. The same God is with us in all the supremacy of his transcendent being and power and love. I quoted Herman Bovink on Thursday. Let me read it again. Bovink says, It is a mark of God's greatness that without losing himself, God can give himself. And while absolutely maintaining his immutability, he can enter into an infinite number of relations with his creatures. Machen says this, God is imminent in the world, not because he is identified with the world, but because he is the free creator and upholder of it. God doesn't divide himself to relate to us. He doesn't deny himself. He doesn't modify himself. He doesn't leave any deity behind when he draws near. He relates to you and to me as the transcendent God. And this is the most wonderful implication of his transcendence. It's only by preserving the transcendence of God that we recognize the God whom we know in the gospel. In Jesus Christ, the God who is never hungry becomes our food and drink through the Son. The God who never changes is changing us into the image of his Son. The God who knows all things has made himself known to us through the Son. The God who gives his glory to no other gives himself to us in the gospel, drawing us ever nearer to him from one degree of glory to the next. It's no wonder that modernist religion has sought to drive a dagger through the heart of God's transcendence. Because if you destroy God's transcendence, you destroy everything Christian. 
You destroy every attribute of God. You destroy a proper conception of God's imminence in the world. You either make God lost in space or you plunge him into the change of this world. You rob the church of the blessing of salvation. You prepare the way for a counterfeit God and a false religion. So how is this done? Modernist attempts to compromise divine transcendence. I want to suggest to you this morning that the relentless compromise among modernists proceeds along about four steps, uh, four movements. Now, a couple caveats here. Uh, some of these moves might be more prominent than others. Uh, they overlap with one another. There's a sense in which uh, a compromise of divine transcendence underlies every one of these steps. But this is the overt anatomy, it seems to me. Th these are the active steps uh, that are often involved. And the first is what we could call the epistemological move. Epistemology dealing with knowledge, how we know what we know. In the epistemological move, one begins with a functional commitment to the authority of human reason above the Word of God. Uh, this move was grounded in the principles inherited from the European Enlightenment. It came to religious expression, most prominently in theological liberalism. But at the tail end of the Enlightenment, and, and Dr. Truman mentioned this earlier, Immanuel Kant summarized the spirit of the Enlightenment with these words. He said, dare to know. Have the courage to use your own reason. That is the motto of the Enlightenment. Well, with this elevation of human reason came the assumption that human reason was neutral and untainted by sin and untouched by God. And its principal object of operation was this world conceived as a closed system of cause and effect. And inheriting this epistemological move, Protestant liberalism looked at supernatural Christianity and said, how can we save this? How can we rescue the Christian faith from irrelevance, from floating away on the sea of Enlightenment assumptions. And, and instead of critiquing the deepest assumptions of the Enlightenment, Protestant liberalism was like um, packing for a trip when you're pressing your clothes into your suitcase and you try to zip up the suitcase but your clothes are falling out the side. And so you just take scissors and you cut your clothes off and then zip up your suitcase and say, it all fits. Liberalism gets out the scissors and tries to fit the Christian faith into the modernist assumptions inherited from the Enlightenment. Harry Emerson Fosdick, in his 1922 sermon, Shall the Fundamentalist Win, said this, we must be able to think our Christian faith clear through in modern terms. Gary Dorian of Union Theological Seminary says, liberal theology in essence holds that Christian theology can be genuinely Christian without being based upon external authority. This is not only an illusion, this is, this is serpentine. This is precisely what Adam does in the garden. He makes this epistemological move. He, he believes he could be genuinely human without an external authority. Of course, in this move, Adam had already compromised God's transcendence in his heart. So I'm not saying that already in the epistemological move, transcendence has already been compromised. It certainly has. But let's look at the anatomy, the unfolding. If modernism's epistemological move concedes to the Enlightenment view of human reason, how did modernism address a Bible that is so plainly supernatural in its content? How did it salvage the outward respect for Scripture while modifying it? How did it get out the scissors and, and cut away everything that didn't fit? Well, this leads to the second move that I'm calling the hermeneutical move. We'll move through some of these more quickly. Hermeneutics deals with the interpretation of Scripture, as you know, and in this move, the modern compromiser reads the Bible through the lens of modern assumptions. This move obviously is related to the first epistemological move, but it closely follows, having subjected Scripture to the supremacy of the human mind, 
The modernist then reads the Bible through the lens of modern life. Again, Fosdick, from his 1924 book, The Modern Use of the Bible, Fosdick captures how well um, the strategy that the liberal says we must read the Bible. He says, quote, it is impossible that a book written two to three thousand years ago should be used in the 20th century AD without having some of its forms of thought and speech translated into modern categories. Well, what does this translation work? Well, he said, we use the language of Scripture, but we don't use that language to refer to supernatural things. We interpret this language as symbols and pictures and representations that point us to things that are inspiring and, and relevant. And here's the key, things that are acceptable to modern man. A number of years ago, I had the opportunity to visit a mainline church here in the Atlanta area under circumstances that I'll remain unspoken out of those whom I love. But I visited this church over Christmas time and listened as we recited the Apostles' Creed and sang traditional hymns. And then about a week later, the Spirit came over me and I wrote to the pastor. And I said this, this December, I noticed that the liturgy and hymns at your church referred to the historical Jesus as the incarnate deity who is the offspring of the virgin's womb. We sang about God and sinners reconciled and, and to the notion that Jesus not only rose again from the dead on the third day, but that he will come to judge the living and the dead in the future. I'm also tracking with your very fitting calls to make God's love visible in the world as the church of God. That's basically the motto of the church. What I would appreciate your help with is whether you believe it is necessary to hold to the Jesus of history as virgin born and divine, to his bodily resurrection in history, and to his future return, are these essential to the old story we celebrate at Christmas? Are these historical points pivotal for grasping God's love and mercy, especially as the church goes out to make God's love visible in the world? And she wrote back, what a wonderful email for a pastor to receive three exclamation points. The short answer is no, capital N, capital O, exclamation point. Why is the answer no? Well, it's because for the liberal, we must learn to read the Bible by looking through the language of the Bible to the so-called truths they represent, truths that are reasonable, the truths that are recognizable by modern man. Horace Bushnell, the, the father of American religious liberalism, said this, it is the grand peculiarity of the religious writings that they deal in supernatural events and transactions. But let us not be misunderstood. We do not assume the truth of the narrative by which the manner and facts of the life of Jesus are reported to us. We only assume the representations themselves and discover their necessary truth in the picture of divine excellence and beauty exhibited in them. Well, the epistemological leads to the hermeneutical, and the hermeneutical now leads to the theological, the theological move. This is, this is the event of the denial of God's transcendence itself the translation of divine transcendence into something less threatening and more palatable. This is the bitter fruit of the hermeneutical move. Harry Emerson Fosdick again uh, preached not only shall the fundamentalist win, but he preached another sermon called, What Does the Divinity of Jesus Mean? In it, he tells us how the hermeneutical strategy applies to the transcendent glory of Jesus. He says, Isaac Newton looked at the falling apple in the orchard until he overpassed looking at it and looked through it into a universal law. Those first disciples looked at Jesus until they overpassed looking at him and looked through him into a revelation of something eternally true about God. And then in telling us what they saw, Fosdick tells us what he sees and thus what Jesus' divinity means. He says, we recognize in him a transcendent quality 
a most amazing, potent spiritual life. This is what the deity of Christ means for Fosdick. It means to see in Jesus a transcendent quality. It means to see in him the highest moral aspirations of man. That is the transcendence of God for liberalism. That is the deity of God. It's the moral ideal shining in Jesus of Nazareth. Cornelius Van Til, Machen's colleague, said that the the method for compromising transcendence and the whole Christian faith was one of reinterpretation. In 1961, he wrote this, if it was true in mo of modern theologians a half century ago that they put new meanings into old words, this is doubly true today. Recent theologians do not reject the gospel, they simply reinterpret it. Now, what's interesting about Van Til is he's not only saying that the older liberals engaged in this task of reinterpretation, but he was talking about theologians of his own day in the mid-20th century, especially those who followed the pioneering work of the theologian Karl Barth. Now, we should probably say just a little bit about Karl Barth because Van Til described Barth's theology as the new modernism. Barth was a Swiss theologian. He died in 1968. His theology came in like a tidal wave across the landscape of academics, and he made all the three moves as the liberals. He made the epistemological move with great gusto. He rejected the Bible as the inspired written word of God. He said it was not revelation, nor should it ever be identified as revelation. He made the hermeneutical move. But, but Bart made it with a twist. He said that, that God uses the Bible to speak to modern man in a way that is ineffable. In other words, if the liberal used the Bible to speak to modern man, Bart said God uses the Bible to speak to modern man, but the God who speaks through the Bible remains unknowable. He said this, the Bible is God's word to the extent that God causes it to be his word, to the extent that he speaks through it. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like getting hit by a lightning bolt in an instant, and then you look up to the sky and, and all you see is cloudless blue. Incidentally, I had a friend post online that she had gone to the inauguration of the new president for Princeton Theological Seminary last week, and I couldn't help myself. I went online and watched a little bit of it. Dr. Jonathan Lee Walton was installed as the new president of Princeton Seminary. And I listened as, as the Board of Trustees uh, chairman uh, delivered the, the questions, the vows that the new president took. And, and this was vow number two. Do you accept the scriptures as the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ for the church Catholic and by the Holy Ghost, God's word to you? Bart is alive and well at Princeton Theological Seminary. Having made the epistemological move and the hermeneutical move, Bart then makes the theological move. The God who does not reveal himself in the Bible as the word of God, but only through the Bible as the word of man, this God cannot be known or named. He is so transcendent, so free, however, that he can take humanity into himself. He could take creatureliness into union with his own being and become a creature himself. Bart said, God is free to conceal his divinity from the creature, even to become a creature himself, and free to assume again his Godhead. This is not the historical incarnation, friends. This is God choosing a creaturely nature for himself. If, if Fosdick dragged God down and identified him with humanity itself, Bart's God is a, he's a slippery shapeshifter. He said, God is free to maintain as God his distance from the creature. He's equally free to limit himself, to be confined to this or that time and place. I mentioned Bart, and we're almost done with him, because he shows us that there's more than one way to compromise God's transcendence. You can either deny God's transcendence outright, or you can distort it by making God unknowable. Either way, if God has any dealings with us at all, he will either be a creature like us or he will be unknown. I also mention Bart because 
he reminds us that compromises to God's transcendence are always coming. They're always coming. We might think that modern liberalism and Bart's neo-modernism are all that we have to contend with, but we would be mistaken. Uh, there are some evangelicals today who would hold to inerrancy but fail to read the scriptures well and end up defining and redefining God's transcendence. There was a recent sermon preached from a Reformed seminary by a faculty member who said this, quote, God loves us so much that he comes in the process of changing us and changes himself. Unbiblical accounts of God's imminence flow from unbiblical accounts of God's transcendence. You mess with one, you mess with the other. And the rebellion of the epistemological move leads to the agenda of the hermeneutical move, which provides for the doctrinal redefinition of the theological move. But then I said there were four moves. The fourth and final move is the ethical move. It's the bitter fruit of compromising God's transcendence. It's the attempt to live under the illusion of being able to evade the ethical demands of the transcendent God. This is the real goal. Protestant liberalism, Bardianism, evangelicalism without a creed can hardly contend with the heart-shattering reality of the transcendent God who is. Bart himself made this ethical move. Some of you will know that in the past recent years it was very much known in a popular level that Karl Barth welcomed a mistress into his home, a relationship that he had for 40 years. She became his research assistant, wrote portions of his church dogmatics. He moved her into the home with his wife Nellie and their five children. If we can elevate human reason above God's self-revelation, if we can read God's word as if it were no more than a record of human symbols, if we can reinterpret God's transcendence to mean the hopeful promise of human nature, then sure, we can think we can evade his law upon our lives. We, we can assuage our conviction of sin, that this is just a psychological problem to be addressed therapeutically. We, we make God out to be one of us, just a stranger on the bus trying to find his way home. Fosdick closes his article, What Does the Divinity of Jesus Mean?, by saying this, Christ's divinity is in each of us, for the God who is in Jesus is the same God who is in us. This is quite something, a redefinition of God's transcendence to mean the deity of man. But again, if Christ's deity is simply his compelling personality and a sign of what's possible for me to become, then, then I don't need to submit to him or flee to him or, or worship him. As Machen said, I only need to admire him as the kind of religious influencer I need, a kind of TikTok Jesus who enchants me not the king of glory who rules me. Well, it's not just moderns or liberals or Bardians or misguided evangelicals who compromise God's transcendence. I would submit to you that the temptation to do it is in all of our hearts. We're always tempted to elevate our minds above the scriptures, always tempted to read the Bible in a way that denies what it plainly teaches always tempted to reinterpret God's transcendence in ways that boost our ego and drag him down from heaven, always tempted to evade his holy law. My colleague at Westminster, Aaron Messner, and I were talking about this, and he said, isn't it the fourth move, the, the ethical move, that, that underlies all the others? And I think he's right. It's the ethical move that drives the compromise. It's what makes us want to subordinate the Bible and, and misread it and redefine its theology. It's, it's the relentless reality of sin that makes people want to reduce God down to an enlarged but helpless creature or else remove him as an ultimately unknown, impersonal sky god. So finally, what do we do? How do we guard the plot? How do we maintain the creator-creature distinction and glory and his imminent relation to us as, as the transcendent one? Well, very briefly, I think the answer is hidden in these four moves that we've discussed. Epistemologically, we must not try to master God's word so much as strive to be mastered by it. We have to remember the absolute authority of God's word is a function 
of the absolute authority of the God who speaks. We have to remember that God's transcendence is not a problem to be solved, but a mystery to be adored. We have to believe the Bible when it says that His transcendence is never denied or laid aside in His relation to us. It's never overcome, but displayed in the Incarnation. It's not minimized or reduced, but magnified as God draws near to us in redemption. Second, hermeneutically, we need to interpret God's Word in light of God's transcendence rather than use certain verses in order to deny it. The great challenge of the present day in some quarters is how to interpret the text related to God's repentance and changing plans and flaring with emotion and moving in space. And if it needs to be said, let us say it. These texts do not mean that God denies His eternal and immutable being. God reveals His transcendent, unchanging glory in the unfolding of His decree, in His real activity in the world, and Scripture often uses accommodated expressions to reveal something true about God's activity and purpose. His real activity and all of His relations with the world are so many rays shining forth the unchanging glory of God for our eternal good. God reveals who He unchangeably is in all that He does. And then third, theologically, we protect the plot as we relish creedal confessional exposition of God and His attributes. John Owen says, we behold the glory of Christ when we see in Him the operations of the essential glory of the immutable God. He said it more simply this way, the glory of Christ is the glory of the person of Christ. Machen says something similar. He said, far from bringing God nearer to man, the pantheism of our day really pushes Him very far off. It brings Him physically near but at the same time makes him spiritually remote. For we cannot love or trust a God of whom we are parts. And then he makes systematicians sing when he says this, if we're going to retain the faith, we must cling with all our hearts to what are called the metaphysical attributes of God, his infinity and omnipotence and creatorhood. So we are to be mastered by the word. We are to read it in light of God's transcendence. We are to do it by relishing the creeds of the church. And then finally, ethically, we're to bow our hearts, close our mouths, open our ears, submit our desires to the transcendent God. And we are to rejoice that our intimate and eternal inheritance is nothing less than the God who is and forever will be transcendent. Only a transcendent God can tell us how great is our guilt and corruption in Adam. Only a transcendent God will reveal His wrath and fury on the last day. But only a transcendent God can save. Only He who has decreed whatsoever comes to pass can make the church's redemption the central purpose of history. Only He who knows the end from the beginning and transcends time can declare to us what is to come with utter certainty. Only a transcendent God can act in space without becoming spatial. Only He can act in time without becoming temporal. Only He can give Himself to us without denying Himself. Only He whose wisdom transcends the foolishness of this age can send the Savior, who remains transcendent even in His human flesh as He redeems sinners from hell. Only he who dwells in unapproachable light, as we heard this morning, can send out his light and truth to lead us in union with our Savior to his holy hill. And only a transcendent God will do all of this for your everlasting good. And brother and sister, he has done it. So in Christ, let's see the conjunction. Let's understand the function of the conjunction and let's make our choice. And if we make the right choice, holding fast to the transcendent God and the gospel of His Son, knowing that He has laid hold of us in Christ, then we can say this with Jeremiah, There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? 
for this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. Would you pray with me? Our gracious and living God, you are transcendently bright and blessed. You are self-existent and self-sufficient. You are the infinite and eternal spirit who has all perfections in and of himself. You are the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you dwell in unapproachable light whom no man has ever seen nor can see. Yet the wonder of wonders is that you've given yourself to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Possessing you transcends all of the delights of the world. You are most satisfying, showering yourself upon us through the resurrection life of our Lord, through the victor who has become the life-giving spirit. Oh Lord, we ask that you would today and in the days to come be the feast and Sabbath of our soul forever. For we pray this through Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for joining the conversation on the Westminster Standard Podcast, which is brought to you by Jude 3. Visit our website, jude3pca.org. And come back again next week as I am joined by Pastors David Strain and George Sayor for a conversation on the influence of progressivism in the PCA and the importance of maintaining strong principles related to confessional subscription. Talk to you then.